that is sort of a typically known as a caramelization uh, reaction. Now, of course, uh, caramelization is not happening alone when you're roasting a coffee, so there's a lot of other things happening, and sometimes it's a bit, bit difficult to say what is caramelization, and what is Maillard reaction, and what is all this, uh, because it's sort of a whole network of reactions uh, that's happening, as Morton also showed you in this uh, big diagram, uh, where he said, like, I would explain all that. <laughs> Uh, and, and it's really, we're talking about uh, a lot of parallel reactions, uh, and it's, it's big soup, uh, in a way. So, but the, the, the sugar uh, breakdown, uh, you can have like uh, components like maltol, uh, you can have uh, some of the furfurals uh, can uh, form directly from, uh, from the sugars. Then uh, we see fragmentation uh, reactions, uh, where we can form some acids. Um, and, but often uh, linked to the fragmentation, uh, is then also the, uh, the Maillard uh, reaction, uh, where you have then the parallel striker uh, degradation. And, th and I think this is really, uh, uh, you say, quantitatively a very important uh, reaction during the roasting. And we also know that because the beans get brown and we, and we develop uh, flavor notes that uh, can really be related to these uh, uh, components. And here's just uh, some of the impact components uh, shown here. We have the pyrazines, again, the furfural uh, thiol, uh, which is a very important uh, component uh, for roasted coffee. I'll come back to that also later on, uh, that it is not a very stable component. Uh, and then we have here the Mercapto uh, methyl, uh, what is it called, the methyl butyl uh, formate, and then, uh, which is also coming from the Mayan reaction. But this pool is much bigger, uh, but this is just uh, so, some examples. Now, so besides the Mayan reaction, we also see uh, uh, other uh, parallel uh, reactions. Uh, we can. Uh, get the uh, breakdown uh, uh, of the uh, trichonaldine uh, into the uh, nicotinic acid. Uh, we get formation of pyrazines. Pyrazines themselves can also form in the Mayan reaction, so sometimes not really know where, where things uh, might come from. Uh, then we have the, the chlorogenic acids uh, that can break down in various ways. Uh, we can have the quinic acids, we can uh, also the chlorogenic acid lactones. And these components, uh, they are often associated with bitterness. Uh, so, so, we, uh, so, so they have a, a, a contribution to the bitter taste. And then also here, we see the breakdown of the chlororganic acids. Uh, uh, we have the uh, cathic acid, the fluoric acid as some main uh, components. And in the thermal reactions, uh, they can break down and uh, they can, for instance, form the uh, vanillin uh, and different kind of glycols. Uh, and these, uh, the vanillin, we all know, that has a vanil uh, vanilla taste. Uh, whereas the uh, glycols have these uh, smoky uh, 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 taste properties. The organic acids can be a source of CO2 uh, during roasting. Uh, we have the lipids, and I still am a little bit puzzled with the lipids, uh, and I have to have more discussions uh, with uh, Morton about this, uh, to see what, what is really the contribution also in this roasting reaction. Because we know when we're heating up uh, foods and you have lipids, uh, uh, they, they at high temperature, they can actually also uh, break down. And uh, the breakdown with lipids, especially in the presence of oxygen, uh, you get sort of an oxidative breakdown of lipids. And uh, these are radical reactions. And uh, in the classical view of the Maillard reaction, that there you normally you say, okay, this is the amino acid that links with the sugar, uh, and then you get the Avedora rearrangement, etc., etc. But we know that lipids also, uh, when you have radicals, so there is also a radical pathway uh, linked into the Maillard reaction, so that some of the reactions uh, that occur in the Maillard reaction can also be through, through uh, radical mechanisms, and often these mechanisms, they happen uh, at the, at the uh, uh, stage uh, where you get the, uh, the brown uh, color formation. Uh, and, and this is a very interesting uh, issue because I think lipids could be part of the initiation of uh, these radical mechanisms. And, and so, so I think that that should be uh, given some more attention to what's really the role of lipids in, in all this. Because uh, as I said, quantitatively lipids are quite high in, in, in coffee beans. And then uh, the last uh, group of uh, precursors uh, in, in coffee uh, roasting and, and giving to, uh, lead, uh, leading to some flavor components that are carotenoids. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have the beta so when you can also think of other components that uh, come from this. I just have added here two components is the alpha beta uh, ionone, uh, which have uh, some kind of a raspberry uh, kind of flavor. And uh, I, I don't know if they, they are that important for coffee roasting, but I just mentioned these kind of components can be formed. Uh, and especially, I think, when one when modulates 
uh, the roasting conditions. Uh, you can, of course, make coffees that have a lower roast, and then maybe some of those uh, notes uh, could become actually uh, more uh, more available to give more the the, the, the floral notes and, and uh, uh, the less roasted notes. Okay, so that's sort of an overview of all the uh, reactions that, that uh, we know occur when we roasting uh, coffees. I just have a slide here that uh, besides all the volatile components uh, that are formed, uh, bitter components are, I think, very important. And normally people say, okay, it's the caffeine. Uh, and that's, of course, true because uh, caffeine is present at, uh, at a very high concentration in, in, in coffee. So, so uh, of course, that is contributing to bitterness. But in fact, there's also other components that we know uh, have bitter uh, properties. And I just mentioned just a few. Uh, it's, it's much more than this. Uh, but for instance, uh, we know if you have proline, uh, this is an amino acid that when you look at striker degradation, it's a bit, bit tricky in the striker degradation because the proline is a closed uh, ring. But if you uh, uh, get, have heat on, on proline together with sugars, you actually get uh, some, some bread-like component, like bread crusts uh, smell, popcorn smell. You get also uh, components uh, that when you taste uh, the, these roasted systems, that they taste very bitter. And uh, there's several studies done, and uh, actually, uh, I have done studies not so much in coffee, but much more in bread and in, 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 uh, in, 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 in cooked cereals. And, and there we also found, uh, when we have the proline, we find a certain class of components, the SP gnomes, and they, uh, in very, very small quantities, they taste very bitter. So, so uh, this is just adding a point that we have the caffeine, of course, that's the major one, but actually underneath that, there can be many other components that also contribute to bitterness. Also other Maillard reaction products like the pyrazines, the melanoids. Uh, we have also uh, the, uh, the lactones of the chlorogenic acid, as, as I just showed you before, which is actually the two main ones that, uh, that people have found uh, to contribute to bitterness in, uh, in, in roasted coffee. So, so this just also to be aware that this, this is really a pool of, of many, many components that actually can have uh, bitter functions. And we also know because uh, you, you have to be aware that when we think about bitterness uh, in people, uh, we have 25 receptors for, for, for bitter taste. And some uh, receptors are activated by particular components, whereas other receptors are activated by other uh, kind of chemical structures. So, so it's actually quite good in coffee if you want to have bitterness. There's a lot of components that uh, uh, can contribute, so we can really activate our bitter receptors. Okay, so I have a little bit on the, uh, a little bit more on the Maillard reaction, and more than that, I should not. Uh, Go, go too much into all the chemistry, so I said, okay, uh, I'll, I'll keep it a little bit low. And then uh, yesterday, when I was looking at the program, I could see that they filled the whole hour of the, the program. I said, oh my God, I have to talk for a long time. He told me only 20 minutes, uh, half an hour max. So, so then I put some more slides in, but uh, I, I can also go maybe, maybe a little bit quickly over those slides because I think I, I, I just touched already on the principles. This is just, uh, just to show you a little bit more that this my reaction is quite complex. Um, but uh, maybe it's a little bit interesting is that if you, look, if you really want to, to know about this, you have a lot of pathways that are going, going on at the, at the same time. But you can have, uh, in, 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 when you look at sugars, we can have uh, sugars that have a five ring and you have sugars that have a six ring, the aldose and the pentose. And then uh, depending on the, how they, in the first part of the Maillard reaction react, then you have either the Heinz uh, component or you get the Amor Amadoric uh, component. But there's one little thing here which is in, which interesting, and maybe uh, one could play a little bit with that in, uh, in coffee roasting, or at least in the fermentation of the coffee beans, is that uh, when, when you look at my reaction, uh, it's a pH dependent. So the breakdown of these components here is pH dependent. And you have uh, a one, one, two inhalization step and a two, three inhalization step. And this step uh, is favored by more acidic conditions. So this reaction just goes faster when it is more acidic. Uh, was this one uh, is then favored at the more alkaline uh, condition. So, so this is maybe something to play with because if you look at what happens when you have this uh, one-two inhalation, uh, then you get a, a particular group of components formed, whereas you have a quite different pathway uh, along the line uh, when you have a little bit more uh, or a little bit less acidic uh, conditions. Uh, so, so this is maybe something uh, to, to say about pH could be something that uh, one could work a little bit with uh, in roasting reactions. This is just to show you the stack of degradation, not so much uh, the camps, but just that, that this is a very elegant way of producing pyrazines. Mm -hmm. And as I said, pyrazines are quantitatively very important uh, in, in coffee roasting, and you just uh, can react any amino acids, and depending on the kind of amino acid, you will then get a pyrazine, and you get also a stacker aldehyde. 
And if you look at stacker aldehydes, so always the 2-methyl, butanol, 3-methyl, butanol, uh, you get uh, phenyl, ethanol, uh, ethanol and, and you have like a, a group of uh, stacker aldehydes that are very typically uh, found uh, in the coffee, so we know that this is important. But at the same time, when you look at the roasting process, some of these aldehydes actually are formed and then they disappear again. Uh, and that's also known in these uh, heating systems, is that uh, at some point it gets so hot uh, that it is so favorable for these aldehydes actually to react further. So if it gets too hot uh, in roasting, then, then they will just disappear. Some of them, they will just also blow, uh, blown away when you do the traditional roasting process. So there can be many various things happening. Now, if I look at the Maillard reactions, uh, I mentioned the pH, but there's a lot of things, of course, that influence Maillard reactions. Uh, and so you have a lot of things to play with when you do roasting, at least from a theoretical point of view. Um, you have the temperature and thereby also the programming of the temperature. Uh, you can think about the time. Uh, I did for many, many years uh, experience in extrusion cooking. Uh, there we had only like 60 seconds to generate the flavor. Uh, and you actually do it uh, high pressure, short time, uh, and, and high temperatures. Uh, you, in 60 seconds, you can get really a lot of flavor so develop. But these are things that you can play with, of course, in coffee is a different system, but this is uh, your variables. Moisture level, I think, is important because we know that if you look at Maillard reaction, effectively you remove water from the from the sugar molecules in the Maillard reaction. If you look at it sort of on a helicopter view, and and so moisture level is quite important because if you have a quite high moisture level, it somehow uh, slows down the Maillard reaction because the water is not removed uh, from the system. So that's also a little bit when I think about this lowering roasting and the, and, and the traditional roasting. Uh, that's uh, quite a different because you will see that the moisture level is different in, in these uh, roasting uh, conditions. So, and I think that's important. We have the pH, uh, then of course the type of flavor precursors, uh, and then it should not be uh, neglect that normally people look at my as just one reaction and then uh, we think we all know it, but it's actually a lot of things happening at the same time. And we know uh, in other foods, for instance in meat, uh, there, there, when you roast the meat, uh, you, you see uh, that the lipid oxidation uh, is uh, interfering with the Maillard reaction. And we have done studies in the past on that, and we know quite a bit on that. And I was just so wondering if certain, certain kind of things are also happening in the, uh, in the coffee uh, roasting. Uh, because uh, these, these are competing reactions, and they take away some of the precursors for the really nice uh, flavor components uh, uh, that you want to have. Uh, so, so to me, that's uh, maybe something that we should uh, look a little bit more into. So then, then in the discussion with Morton, we had this on the lowering roasting. Uh, I had never heard about this, and he explained this, oh, that's very interesting, and then I read a little bit about it, and so I put some, some of the things uh, on, on, uh, on the slide here. I mean, I think this is uh, quite interesting that you try to, I think that the idea is to reduce the energy is needing, needed for the, for the roasting. That's, of course, an advantage, because, you know, that, that is a cost. And, and, uh, so, so they recirculate uh, the air, but that means that uh, the oxygen levels will drop, and you see also that the moisture uh, level uh, is relatively high in comparison to traditional roasting. At least that's how I understood this. And so then the question was like, well, does this oxygen have any uh, impact on the, on the flavor formation? And as Morton said, like oxygen in the Maillard reaction, or it's not really uh, a major uh, factor. It doesn't really interfe interfere too much. But then still we said, okay, well, let's just look a little bit uh, what, what happens uh, when we uh, make this model system and, and see if oxygen uh, could have any, anything to do uh, with this. Uh, so we, Morton showed you this uh, very nice uh, system at the DTU University where they made this 